So with the recent upsurge of youth activism here in America, especially around issues of gun violence and gun control, I've been thinking a lot about mentorship. Because I think behind every successful youth movement, there are a lot of other um, caring adults that are helping to support it and see it through. So standing behind all the young people are their teachers, parents, community activists coming in to give guidance, and also a lot of people who have contributed financial resources and are helping to manage them. And I find that really inspiring and hopeful uh, because, you know, just the sense of intergenerational support for values that we care about is something that gives me a lot of hope, especially because when I was studying Southeast Asian history, um, I read a lot about post-colonial independence movements that were driven by young people that were quickly squashed by autocratic governments. Like, I remember reading about how um, universities in Thailand were designed such that young people could not protest. And as we well know what happened in China during the Cultural Revolution, a lot of young people were um, manipulated, I would say, to join the Red Guard and then to do really horrific things like um, denouncing their own parents that they had to heal from and live with afterwards. So we can see that um, adult influence on young people is not always benevolent. It can go quite awry. So it makes me very joyful whenever um, it's going in the right direction. So in that vein, uh, I wanted to share with you about uh, an American monk that we learned about last year when Venerable Children and I were in Malaysia, who is credited for being the father of the Malaysian Buddhist youth movement, to our great surprise. Because <laughs> Venerable hasn't been to Malaysia in quite a number of years, and she was invited last year by the Young Buddhist Association of Malaysia. And we were just amazed at how enthusiastic and well-organized these young people were. You know, they're working full-time jobs in their 20s, but they still take out all this time to organize all kinds of Dharma events, participate. Yeah, so we were asking them, you know, what's, what were the factors that allowed for such a vibrant youth movement to grow? So one of them said that in the 60s, all the university and like a community college youth groups got together. They signed a charter and formed an umbrella youth organization which is today the Young Buddhist Association of Malaysia. And then another person said, but the real root of the youth movement is Father Sumangalo. And some of us were like, Father who? <laughs> you know, they said, oh, you know, it's some sort of monk from America, but you know, we just know him as Father Sumangalo. And then we had no time to talk further, but the interesting thing is the next day when we went to Penang, that was a meeting in Kuala Lumpur, the next day we went to Penang, we were in a restaurant that was 10 minutes away from the Father Sumangalo Memorial Hall. So we said, oh, please take us there. We want to know who this person is. So um, it turns out that he is an American monk who was born in 1903 uh, in Alabama during the Jim Crow era. I know, it's just unbelievable. Um, and then he was in Malaysia for five years. And during that time, he set up a lot of youth groups. He started Sunday schools. He created the t teaching curriculum for these schools. He spent all this time with the young people. He created the idea of Buddhist hymns. So through that period of five years, till today, those structures are still around. And it was so sweet to see, as the young people took us around the memorial hall, all of them had such a fond feeling towards him, even though many of them haven't actually met him in person, because all of them have been through the same Sunday school curriculum, and they had the sense of Dharma friendship. So they were all like, yes, he's our like, founding father, and we all love and respect him. It's like, wow. So today I just wanted to read you the life story of Father Samangalo in his own words and maybe pause from time to time for uh, some comment. But yes, it is a remarkable tale. So he says, I was born 55 years ago, that was 1903, into a devout Christian family in the state of Alabama in America. For more than 300 years, my family had always given its eldest son to be a Christian minister. It was expected of me too, that I would be a minister as I was the only son. However, at the early age of years, I began to doubt many Christian teachings and to read all books on the subject of religion that I could get. In the public library of the city where I lived, I found books on Islam, Judaism, Taoism, Shinto, Confucianism, and Buddhism. I read all these books, and those that told about the Buddhist teachings impressed me very deeply, and I began to read, uh, read all books I could obtain on the subject of Buddhism. When I was 13, I announced to my rather surprised and somewhat amused family that I had become a Buddhist. <laughs> my family thought that this was only a childish adventure on my part and would soon be forgotten. They were wrong. 
The more I studied the teachings of Buddhism, the more I became convinced that I had found the only religion in which I could ever believe. It is now 40 years since I became a Buddhist believer, and I shall remain a believer all my life. I have never at any time regretted becoming a Buddhist, although at times I have had to endure a certain amount of persecution. <laughs> so this in itself is, um, I guess, a good teaching on karma. Yeah, that this person could be born in the middle of a totally Christian culture and society and through his own reading, decide for himself he was going to become a committed Buddhist. Yeah. So he goes on. He says, when I finished my studies at university, I began to give lectures on Buddhism from time to time. 25 years ago, I began to give regular lectures each week in San Francisco, California. After two years, I went to Japan and China to study Buddhism more deeply, and I remained in North China and Japan for one year and became a priest in Kyoto 23 years ago. Since then, I have lectured all over Europe and South America and the Hawaiian Islands. There are many Buddhists and many Buddhist societies in Europe and America, and the number of Buddhist believers is growing every year. When I became a Buddhist, there were only 13 Buddhists in all of North America. <laughs> I'm not sure how he knows this, but now there are more than 100,000 believers. And he says, 25 years ago, I tried hard to find a Chinese Buddhist in San Francisco. There are more than 75,000 Chinese in the city, and I could not find even one who was a Buddhist. All were Christians. Now the Chinese people in America are coming back to Buddhism, and now there is a large and beautiful Chinese Buddhist temple in San Francisco, and soon there will be other Chinese Buddhist temples in New York City and Chicago. The Chinese in America have seen that many Americans are becoming Buddhists, and that has caused the Chinese to make a careful examination of the Buddhist teachings. This is also true in Canada and the Hawaiian Islands, and in France, Germany, and England. Scholars are of the opinion that Buddhism reached its finest development and deepest practice in ancient China. Modern Chinese people are again taking a deep interest in this wonderful religion and are finding that when it is correctly understood, it answers all of life's problems. So this is really interesting, you know, like uh, Venerable Chini pointed this out to me when I first told her of this story, that you often think of the transmission of the Dharma being from uh, east to west, as if it just went in one direction. But you can see it was going in so many directions, and there's a strong influence from west to east too, especially with the Chinese immigrant or other immigrant communities in Western countries. And for me, I met the Dharma in America. There's no way I would have connected in Singapore where I had the view that it was very traditional or related to superstition. So to come to the US where it was stripped of a lot of the cultural stuff, like I remember we chanted the Heart Sutra in English with a wooden fish and just sat. And to me, that was like, oh, okay, I, 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 this is helping my mind. Whereas if it were all in Chinese with ritual, I might have been like, eh, I don't know, it's farewell. So, you know, just the different forms that Buddhism is taking now that are helping so many people to connect. So he goes on. He says, 20 years ago, there was not one Buddhist in Australia. Now there are four small Buddhist societies there and about 500 Buddhists, mostly of Australian nationality, scattered all over that large country. Most of the converts to Buddhism went through about the same experience that I had. All of them, or most of them, received teachings by reading books on Buddhist teachings. What is needed more than anything else is a good number of teachers to go from place to place and teach the Dharma and answer questions for people. This is what I do with my own life. I hope to be able to spend the remainder of my life in teaching the Dharma to all people everywhere. So four years ago, I left my present home in New York and came to Asia. I spent three weeks among the Buddhists of the Hawaiian Islands and established a Buddhist club at the University of Hawaii. Then I went to Japan for six weeks and lectured at 30 universities while there. After a brief visit to Hong Kong, I went to Rangoon to attend the third conference of the World Fellowship of Buddhists. Then I came to Thailand and I have now been a resident of that country for more than a year. In June last year, I became a monk of Theravada in the kingdom of Laos. <laughs> I do not call myself a Theravadin or a Mahayanist. I am simply a follower of Lord Buddha, and I am very happy to be a friend to anyone who is sincerely trying to follow Lord Buddha's teaching, whether that person is Burmese, Siamese, Chinese, Japanese, European, or American. Buddhism promotes the spirit of friendliness and brotherhood and sisterhood, and I hope that I may be able to spread this teaching more and more. 
It is my firm intention to continue to wear the robes, and I hope that all those who call themselves Buddhists will realize that every one of us can do much to make this a better world by living the Buddhist life and sharing the teachings with all others. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just that he had this incredible vision from the very beginning to connect with people and make Buddhism global, not just take root in America, but to share it wherever he could, um, to think about the impact that he had in Southeast Asia that remains a, a legacy till today. Uh, yeah, it's inspiring. And I think as Buddhism comes of age in America, it's very important to start collecting these stories of the first American Buddhists and monastics so that you know, it starts to form some idea of history and lineage. Now, I was very impressed that in Malaysia, everybody has this sense of the history of Malaysian Buddhism and who are the founding fathers you know, that everyone's grateful towards. So that's something I think to think about. Uh, for sure, if you are writing your PhD and want to research this, write to us. <laughs> I'm happy to give you uh, resources. I mean, some interesting things. He ordained two monks as well. Like, very little is known of them. One of them was a Hollywood star, apparently. <laughs> but, you know, I couldn't gather that much from the photos in the memorial hall. So, you know, there's lots of work to be done, I think, in researching the lives of our um, elders, so to speak, so that they are not uh, lost to the wind and that we yeah, keep Father Sumangalo, Venerable Sumangalo in mind as one of the founding elders of uh, Buddhism in the West. 